Welcome everyone to the Mind Game of Basketball podcast, one-on-one with yourself. Today we uh, welcome Benes Matkevicius, assistant coach with the Lithuanian national team, as well as uh, international scout with the Boston Celtics, and also host of the Benes podcast, where you can listen to some great insights with amazing guests. So thank you, Benes, for being our guest today. Thanks a lot for, for inviting me, and that's the best... Uh pronunciation of my last name by a french person ever <laughs> that's labayachu it's a great compliment Thank you. uh so yes you, we we just discussed the thing you know that uh, i'm married to lithuanian i love lithuanian basketball i'm very lucky uh to um to be uh, uh discovering the the network with the uh, great basketball uh, people in lithuania uh in the federation the clubs but all levels like professionals but also with the basketball schools uh both in vilnius and kaunas so I do have a tremendous respect for the world of basketball. Um, so we're going to start with that because we just finished the World Cup. In the World Cup, you were with the uh, national team as an assistant coach, as you were last year also with the, uh, during the Euro, right? No, last year I wasn't. Last year I wasn't. But you were just the, in, between the, in between the things then, right? In the qualification? Yeah, I was during the windows. During the windows with Kim Zura, I was, I was assistant coach. And before, with the last, last federation before uh, last summer, I was also there for eight years, but now last last summer I didn't didn't make the the staff, but this summer I was back at it again. Okay, okay. So uh, where I wanted to go with that right away is like saying, you know, um, I think you guys have done like amazing job with the with the sixth spot. Obviously, you would have I guess liked to be fifth and finish on the on a tough note against beautiful Latvian team. Mm-hmm. Must be hard because the rest of the worker was amazing, but. Um, you know, like we are often under the critiques of people. For example, you know, like uh, you're going to have a lot of critiques from Lithuanian people uh, at the end of the World Cup saying, oh my God, look at the way they played the last game and why they lost by so many points against Latvia and this and that. And end on a bad note, when in the end, if you had talked about finishing sixth at the before the competition, I think everybody would have signed for it. And just to end the thing, I remember being in a bar in Lithuania but years ago and Lithuania was actually playing Spain before a competition. I don't remember which one. And it was just a like friendly game, preparation game. And they were actually losing by like 20. But every time Lithuania was scoring, Lithuanians were like, you know, clapping and cheering for them every single time. You know, and, and this to me was something that I admired because you could see that no matter how bad they were down, uh, you know, by how many points, they still had the support from their from their fans during the game. And we know that Lithuanian fans are pretty amazing. No matter where Lithuania is playing, they're following them, they're cheering for them and everything. So, OK, I'm just going to be a little more specific. Um, when we are from outside, like I'm French, I respect Lithuania a lot. And maybe I might be a little harder with French people. And from Lithuania, people are very proud of Lithuania. But at the end of the competition, people were also very critical. So, like, um, what do you think about that aspect of uh, perception of things? Do you think that sometimes we take things for granted about the people who are, like, for us and that we're always too hard on them? Or do you feel like it's a a natural thing, a human thing? Again, you have, like, international um, experience. So it's not about just France or Lithuania. It's about the... The world in general i think it's easy to 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 always say it's a mix of both you know it's probably cultural uh, as as well as human nature to kind of um have certain expectations you know and it's it's funny how it works when you have less expectations uh it it usually works out better you know because there's less less pressure less thinking about it you just kind of go out and play and then the achievements are there all of a sudden Human nature is like that. When you give them a little bit, you know, you give them one finger, they want the whole hand, and the the appetite grows uh, with 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 uh, with uh, with each uh, win. And uh, it was beautiful basketball we played, and I got a lot of lot of uh, messages from from all over the world that you know, especially after the U.S. game where it was you know, emotional high, and it's so hard to to really catch all those emotions back and capture them back and put them back into your chest. And a lot of people who have, especially the ones who have not played the game before uh, at, a, at, at a certain level, they have a hard time um, grasping the, the significance of emotional outbursts, you know, of, of leaving everything out on the floor and then 
at the end, you have to recollect yourself uh, physically, mentally, and and get back at it again. And then you face a team like Serbia. That's uh, maybe if you face a different different culture where Serbia is a cutthroat team, they come out there with a killer instinct, and they're gonna try to take what's what's what they think is theirs. And they did. They caught us at the right moment. Uh, for them, it was the right 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 time. And and uh, afterwards, it was hard to again to to put yourself, bring yourself together. Then. You win against, uh, you know, you lose that game. For, let's go back. You win against America. You all of a sudden, you know, are on the top of the world. Everybody believes now they're going to, they want to see medals. Everybody wants to see medals. Everybody believes that you, we are made for this. And even me being with, having been with so many tournaments um, throughout the last uh, 10 years, you, I felt different inside. And I just felt like this is our tournament. This is really our tournament. This is how it's supposed to be, you know, and you kind of envision it and you feel like, um you're still going to put in the work but you feel like this is going to roll keep on rolling because this is it, it just an instinct that i never felt before and little did i know i was wrong because then again serbia you have a wake-up call you lose nothing is working because nothing 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 is is, is popping the, the 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 body language was different everything was different and then all of a sudden you become the biggest loser because you lost to in the quarterfinals where the expectation all of a sudden was higher than before then you beat slovenia and as the world is, there's some sunshine again, some rainbows again showing. And then you lose to Latvia, which we beat in the preparation. And that kind of fueled their fire as well. So there's a lot of things working in a different direction. Uh, all of a sudden, you're the biggest loser again, you know. And, and then it's like, can you make a decision? Can you, is, is there something that we can do better to, to, to uh, by not only trying hard, but also maybe sometimes, you know, doing something different that you think we should do? Because there's a lot of experts out there that think that a certain way uh, the basketball has to be played. Uh, but I also got a lot of messages where even though we lost, even though we, we had um, the, the loss against Serbia or the loss against Latvia, <clears throat> people uh, in offices um, watched the game and, and afterwards stood up and clapped. And, and, you know, I get goosebumps when I hear these stories, when people are still, you know, coming up and saying, man, it was such a great, there's people out there, they still appreciate it. You know, there, there's, it's great to, uh, the win against uh, uh, US and the emotions that we gave to, to ordinary people, you know, to the average person in Lithuania who's watching and has, you know, puts all their, all their emotions into the TV screen. And you feel, you feel kind of the, the obligation to, to at least, you know, try your hardest and then whatever happens, happens. And you hope that it's appreciated. You try the hardest. It's like in a relationship, if you, if you really put everything out on the floor, you put everything out there and you try your best and it doesn't work out, you can still be at peace with your heart that it didn't work out. You know, if you're 50-50, that's like, oh, I don't want to get hurt. You know, I'm not going to play hard. I'm not going to, you know, I'm I'm not going to expose myself too much. In a relationship, if you're not going to be vulnerable, you're not going to feel the love. So in a basketball floor, if you're not going to open up completely and you're going to leave, not leave everything out there, you're not going to hurt it. But it's also not going to be enjoyable if you win because you didn't really apply yourself fully. So the more you apply yourself, the more it's going to hurt, but also the, 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 the joy is going to be bigger too. And I felt like we did that. That's why a lot of times the, the losses that against Serbia it hurt very much so because everybody gave out, gave everything. It was just empty tank, you know. But the wins uh, that we also, we felt, we felt the U.S. win very much so. And because we applied ourselves the whole summer, then you we get the win. The biggest win of the, of the tournament for us at the end was came, came too early. And then it's hard to recollect yourself because you just, you know, you're, you're enjoying this, this uh, joy. And, and um, I can go back if I can add some more to it. It's the same. It was similar in 2013 and 2015, when we, we won the semifinals and we made it to the final of the Eurobasket each, both of those years. And it's also overwhelming joy, you know, because you made it, you're the final. You have, you already have at least the silver medal. That's the raw mentality. You're thinking about the silver medal already, you know, whereas you can, you have to play for the gold. And there's more people coming to see, uh, to visit uh, the, the finals in Ljubljana, uh, tickets, uh, autographs being taken, everything. It's just too many distractions all of a sudden. And you need an experienced and a very um, somber and mentally calm team to really deal with those emotions and forget about it right after, the, after you leave the locker room after the semifinal. But once you, when you release all those hormones and all those, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever is out there, it's, it's, 
it were not machines. It's impossible to recollect it, you know. And France, France was able to do it in 2013 because 2011, they, they lost in the final for that exact reason. They made it to the final in, in, in Lithuania's Eurobasket when it was in Kaunas. And they lost in the final to Spain, I believe. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, they come in 2013 to, to, with this different mindset because they have the experience in them. And they know what it felt like. And it was mostly the same team. And they came in, they came ready, they killed us, and it was done deal, you know. So those are the lessons you have to draw as a player, as a coach. It's just to you you let those emotions out, but all this uh, as at the same time, not all of them. You have to recollect yourself. You have to think about the next step, and you can enjoy yourself after the final and not before. Uh, I think you gave like already a lot, a lot of information, uh, and, and I could just, I mean, the, the podcast would have to last for one afternoon if I had to go precise on everything that you just talked about. Um, I'm just going to try to go with a few things. First of all, like for the ones who know Lithuanian team compared to last year, you had about half of the team was supposed to be like top national players who were not there. Um, so eventually you talked about expectations that might have been lower. So maybe to release, you know, the, um, the, the pressure like you talked about. But what I really enjoyed, and I'm not talking about mental performance coach, but as a fan, as a basketball fan, is really... Uh, the role that each player really um, owned to themselves. You know, like each Lithuanian player went onto the court and accepted their position. You know, you had the leader with Valanciunas, you had all the players with Kuzminskas just being there and reassuring and everything. And then you had the the young ones, Jokubaitis and all, uh, no matter which ones, but they, they were coming and they were playing. And, and when you started, like you talk about the game against U.S., scoring nine, nine three points in a row, like on the first uh, quarter and a half. Um, to me, it was bad defense from uh, so many of them, you know, like they were open shots on many of them at that level of competition. But you had the confidence. It was not just by one player. It's every player that gained from confidence from their teammates. And every time you could see that energy, that positive energy through the tournament, no matter the game that you guys played, with the players coming in and bringing that positive energy, that enthusiasm, you know? And that's how we love as a, as a fan. It's how you love how to see Lithuanian basketball. I think it was actually lacking a little bit last year, um, even though there was the same head coach. Um, so it's not about the same head coach in the situation. And just to go with that, talking about the coaches, uh, according to everything that you just talked about, because it makes total sense. And I believe that all the coaching staffs are going to have to go through, like you said, the same experience to grow. And, and, and you have to go through those experiences to, to be able to perform and to understand, to make it happen. Because it's not just theory. You have to go through it. But my question is, do you believe that coaches really take into consideration the, um, the power, the impact of mental skills enhancement into basketball? Meaning by that, okay, you went through that. But like you said, at some point you went, when you win such a game against US and so many emotions, it's so high. You guys are professional. You guys are amazing coaches and you have each your quality. But do you believe that right now, and I'm talking right now in the Lithuanian team squad, but also in every team in the world, no matter the level, do you believe that we have people who are here to help the players to recharge, to reload mentally, to be able to perform. And not only on the game when it happens, but regularly with consistency through the season so that when those situations happen, we are able with the coaching staff to, to reload faster and, and, and you know, to get back on, on, on track the same way that we do uh, physically. You know, that, Does it relate to you, Ben? So I'm really curious to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, it's like you like you you made a good point. It cannot be uh, that one time thing, you know. Like after the game of US, and now all of a sudden we need somebody to to really talk to. It has to be um, prophylactically, you know. You have to always think ahead and prepare for a lot of different scenarios and be able to talk to the to to the players, to the coaches, coaching staff. A lot of times, it's helpful when the coaching staff has experience in those that those situations, and you can relay certain things you can talk about it and and you you do talk about it uh but at the end of the day uh yes it can be helpful but also not for everybody you know not not everybody needs it so it's 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 kind of like a 
a helping hand that you have along the way that you grab onto if you need to cross the street and you can't do it by yourself that day, you know? So, because it, it comes, the, the national team experience, especially because it's so magnified, it's so um, uh, condensed and dense because it's two months and, uh, uh, and it's really packed in into a really tight window. It's very intense and it's very intense emotionally, physically. So, Sure, there is. And plus, they're coming off a long season and they're going into a long season right afterwards. So there's a lot of things attached to it that to the player's performance that need to be maintained, like a like a like a nice little car that you have in, in, in your in your garage. And you every now and then you need to drive it and you need to change the oil, uh, even though you may not be driving it as often or whatever. But it's there's a lot of things that you need to take in consideration, but it's not probably for every person the same amount of 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 guidance needed you know it's there's some guy some guys try to ever you know everybody deals with it differently Every, everybody has a different approach to the game Every, somebody needs somebody to talk to somebody just doesn't want to be approached at all somebody wants to be approached only at a certain moment certain time when their routine doesn't get messed up and you try to figure that out as also as an assistant coach you talk to them and you want you don't want to interfere with the with the warm-up you don't want to interfere with the routine and that's something you learn throughout the year or throughout the summer. Um, if you work during the season, that's something you also get to know uh, throughout the season uh, preparation. If, you know, if you've been with the same team for a while, you already know the, the, how the player feels and ticks. And everybody, need, you can get to everyone in a different voice. You know, some guy, some guy you do it with jokes. Some guy you do it with, with the seriousness, with a one-on-one -on -one talk, with a coffee break or whatever. But that's it's definitely the mental performance coaching and the, it's it's it 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 has grown over the last uh, let's say ten or so years. Uh, it was already a topic in the in in the soccer field in the field of soccer in in the U.S. Also, it's been it's been a topic, but in, into basketball is just now starting to slide in, and it's also a cultural thing. I think Eastern Europe is slower to open up to that than Western Europe. Uh, I think that you have in, in the big football clubs, um, if I may, it's a European podcast mostly, I assume. So let's say football, <laughs> football um, in, in, in England, uh, they always have a performance, mental performance coach and, and uh, that you, you, you can also, in Germany is the same thing, you know, um, I think it has been ahead of its time in a lot of ways. And I think that Eastern Europe, it's slower to accept it. Um, but the majority, there are some players that all have been using for for years now, but by the majority, it's been slower to accept it uh, because it's a sign of weakness. It's a sign of you can't handle emotions. You can't handle yourself. You're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You shouldn't. You know, there's other. There's mentally and and physically. There's mentally tougher players out there than they're gonna make it. You know, so. I think it's it's a it's a historical thing that that um, back in the day nobody used to talk about their emotions. Now it's more more accepting, not only in, in sports but also in in the day to day. You know, talking about your emotions, your relationships, your 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 ups and downs. Whereas, um, uh, and again, specifically in Eastern Europe, it used to be uh, showing emotions a sign of weakness. You know, you're you're supposed to be uh, somber. You're supposed to be serious and if you are just a little bit of joking around it's also already unprofessional and now the tide is shifting uh, the last years now it's also been a little bit westernized it's, it's been uh, you know more accepting to be loose and that's why the the chemistry was so good the last two years i can't speak for last summer but i heard only good things about last summer and for me specifically this summer was very uh, special in, in regards to cohesiveness uh, amongst the staff amongst the players players with the staff, everybody was, it was one unit and that showed on the court. Everybody was playing together. The ball had energy. The ball was alive. Uh, everybody was sharing the ball, not thinking about themselves. Uh, uh, shots that were really good were, were passed on to get a great shot, which is, it's, that's the goal of every coach, but it's very rare that it happens every, every, you know, every, every game. And, that's that's what makes it special. And I think that uh, Coach Moskitas has a special feeling for that of how to create that environment within within the whole uh, club or uh, team, you know, in, in a national team uh, surroundings locker room where he involves everybody, the whole staff, the whole medical staff. Everybody feels like they're a part of it. Everybody feels like they're contributing. And therefore, when you feel that you're contributing, you're actually going to perform and you're going to feel like you're involved. You're going to feel a sense of accountability 
towards the other person because you have a voice, you have somehow to to put it in. And that's those are the things that I think matter in, in the grand theme of things. And that's a big, um, big compliment to Coach Mosfidus for being able to do that. That's I think that's a gift. You know, not everybody coach can do that. Okay. So uh, I hear you. I hear you totally. Um, one thing that to me, when you define mental uh, performance, right now, all the aspects that you talked about are mainly about the mental health side. You know, the foundations about the control of emotions and, and the well-being of the of the uh, of the player or the coach, by the way. Um, now, I would like you to tell me, um, do you believe, because to me, when I work with the players or the coaches, I have three aspects that I separate clearly. There is the mental health side, that's like the foundational work, but then there is mental performance. For example, how to help players raise their free throw percentage, be able to uh, control the boards better, reduce their turnovers, things similar to this. And the third aspect is developing basketball IQ. So some coaches, you know, would say, oh, but I already do this. And to me, when a coach says something like this, I think it's a lack of being open-minded. And it, I, I also relate to it. Like, for example, in the year 2000, if a coach would say to a strength and conditioning coach, oh, I don't need you. I already make them run. I already make them jump. I already make them do push-ups. I don't need you to do the strength and conditioning coaching. And right now, to me, I relate to this a lot about it because like you talk about, people relate to mental performance a lot, talking about mental health, and it is a big part of it. But we can't just um, make it... Um, you know, make it so small that it's just mental health. And I believe that we need to explain to coaches and work along coaches to say, okay, listen, you're by yourself. You can't just, or even if you're two, three, four in the staff, you can't just do it so much by yourself. Because right now, when we see, again, players like Nick Calates shooting uh, 50, 60% for, for free throw shooters, he's a great European player with a great IQ, in great, uh, he's been in great organizations all his life, but he still shoots 50, 60% uh, free throw percentage. And he even shoots better three pointers than, than free throws. So to me, at some point, it's something that's not been taken care of. And during the um, last uh, final four in, in, in Lithuania, EuroLeague final four, I had a coach who made, played amazing Euro Cup last year and who had trouble with, uh, with his team for free throws. And he lost the game uh, to, to qualify for in the playoffs. And then he actually lost it and played like very poorly in the free throws. And I say, okay, coach, how do you work this out with your, with your players? And the answer was, I do not work on it. It was his decision to not work because he thought that eventually working on it will make it even worse, which in my opinion is understandable, but at the same time crazy in the way that It's already bad. So you really want to attempt something. And so the thing is, no matter the situation, I'm talking a lot about free throws because people can relate to it a lot, but it can be, you know, like the idea is to be able to put the players in the right condition, in the right situations so that they are in, in the condition where they can be performing at a higher percentage. You know, like very often as a scout, you must see it a lot. How often would you see players um, managing less possessions of a, uh, of a quarter, but also last possession when it comes down to the, the time goes down, that the team doesn't even take a shot. You know, like not only they, they miss the shot, but they don't take a shot or they're going to take a shot that the defense eventually gives them. That's going to be a very low percentage shot. And again, I believe that this thing is not being treated enough with consistency in any coaching staff. I'm not talking about Lithuania or any other team. I'm talking in general in basketball through the world. I think like, you know, like some coach say, there is an untapped potential. And I would like to hear your perspective, both as a, as a scout and as an uh, assistant coach of Lithuanian national team. If you believe that's something that makes sense or if you believe that it's not possible for coaching staffs to develop those things. A couple of things. I, I think that a mental performance coach has to be with the team the whole time uh, because there's a lot of... Uh, and and at best have basketball experience himself because there's a lot of dynamics uh, and a lot of uh, nuances to the relationships on the team historically uh, between certain players, reactions, characters, and those affect every aspect of the game, not only the free throws, but every, every aspect, end of, end of the game, you know, performances, end of the game, 
Um, so I think that's important. I also understand some coaches not wanting to work on it because you kind of raise the issue and, and then you kind of make the player even more aware of the issue and he may puts more pressure on the free throw and then all of a sudden you have a, a trickle down effect or a, a snowball effect. But it's also, I think, a matter of how you approach it with the player, of how you want to talk to him about it and, and make it a topic to topic of discussion for him to you know, think about it, maybe to release the pressure a little bit and find techniques that have helped other players and make find examples. Or Jan Vesely would probably be a good example of how it, it changed from one season to another. And then all of a sudden, he doesn't feel the pressure. All of a sudden, from... 50% he goes up to 70%, 75%, whatever. So there's there's examples of that out there that have changed uh, and and improved. And but also every player in it has to be approached in a different way and it, and it has to has to have a different kind of um and not every coach is c- capable of doing that to talk about that topic in particular to talk. So I'm I'm a proponent and I know if I don't know if you do it or not or if you have um if you exercise yourself is breathing techniques, you know? So the thing that that's probably one of the key issues in, in not only free throws, but in key in performances to have the breathing, uh, especially through the nose, because there's a lot of sensors in your nose that either trigger stress or they release stress. If you're, if you're, I mean, if, in your, if you breathe through your mouth, it's going to trigger some stress. If you breathe through your nose, the sensor is going to relieve the stress and it's going to, it's going to calm down your whole nervous system. And that's a way of also having the players, uh, each player that's interested in and giving them the option to work on that and to have techniques ready for them to practice and to mindfully approach the game as a whole, not only from free throw to free throw, but from, from possession to possession and to find yourself to, to be in the moment instead of being too far ahead or too far or, or thinking about what happened the last two possessions, a very, a very important, um, sentence that a lot of coaches use is next play next play move on to the next play don't 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 think about what happened last two possessions because you see players and i see players a lot of young players they're getting frustrated with missing two free throws in a row and they're playing they're going back to play defense and they go out and they're still thinking about those two free throws that happened you know a minute ago so that's the that, those are the things that i think a lot of players need to work on and coaches have to give them the tools to perform better, to find themselves better, to identify themselves on the court, identify the problem as early as possible, and then recognizing it and moving on as soon as possible. Um, and you know, only success or also happiness in life or happiness on a day-to-day basis is if you are in the moment, if you are thinking about what's happening now, you know, and you have you play with your instincts, you anticipate the next play, you are more calm. So finding those calmness spots finding those calm moments and 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 uh, keeping them consistent they're gonna you know it's gonna fluctuate a little bit but as long as it doesn't fluctuate into big highs and lows and big waves you should be fine and the less it fluctuates the better the better the player is Shishkowskis was probably the one who has been had a history of calmness <laughs> and we had in when we were in Moscow together they did always this these tests uh, with um, uh, uh, polar and seeing the 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 blood in the the heart rate, and his was always. I mean, he he recovered so quickly. He never was too high. It was always it was always in 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 the mode of of I don't want to say chill mode, but he was never he was you can never see it going in such a high as lows. And that shows you that he, as a former boxer, also learned how to breathe through his nose. He learned how to control his breathing, how to control his 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 mind. It was never really out of it. You know, he could see he's always in the moment. So. Providing players with techniques, I think a coach with a with experience or a mental performance coach who has those techniques in his pocket should be important and would be important going forward. But again, they have to be present all the time, in my opinion, to identify it and to anticipate it, anticipate the issues, anticipate the the, the problems that may arise, and see the players. Uh, um, struggling with with one thing or another, and you can give them a little bit of a hand. Right. And, and I know, like uh, we talked about a little earlier offline, like two years ago in your podcast, you had a, a Rainer Mastian, who is like mental performance coach in, in US. Uh, and actually, uh, with him, you had talked also about um, a few things. You said that at the time, it was a question also a budget. It was two years ago. Do you believe that from two years ago, uh, this has changed. That's my first question. 
The second is you talk about, and I completely agree with you, and that's why I only work as a mental performance coach with basketball players and coaches. I don't work with other athletes. I love other sports. I play other sports. I watch other sports. When we love sports, we usually like other sports. But my specialty, I believe that my expertise is in basketball. That's why I only work with basketball players and coaches. And we often see sports psychologists or other mental performance coaches who can be very professional in their approach, who might have foundational work that are similar in all the work. But when you are looking at performance like you do as a coach, um, how can you afford to not get people who understand the game, like you say? And, and, and that, that, to me, um, makes, makes your job lose credibility. Because in the end, it's not something that's going to work. Because in the end, players are not going to want to talk and work with you because they're going to feel like, I cannot relate to you. You don't understand what I'm talking about, you know? And, and, and so I would, like to, I would like you to answer my question about this because I do work with players individually. Uh, I had teams myself, and I'm talking to you about me right now. I had team myself uh, being interested over the summer, but not going through. Because eventually, you know, not everybody's on the same page about the mentor performance side. And you got to get yourself known. You know, it's a, like you said before, it's a question of, uh, of network. But you had said also, you always take somebody to open the door for you. And then you got to seize your opportunity, right? And, and right now, I believe I'm uh, also representing a lot of mental performance coaches who are looking to helping players and coaches and organizations. And as of right now, we find a lot of excuses, like eventually the budget or how to make it happen. But when you see how much you can be helping um, uh, organizations and players and coaches, not only in wins or losses, but also in the well-being outside and everything, um, I would like to get your, your perspective on that. Yeah, it's it's a very it's a tricky issue because it's also a cultural issue where where the person is coming from and understanding how the players because majority of the players are going to come from that culture, that, that country that you work in. There's going to be some American players, there's going to be some foreigners, but as majority is there. And it's a, it's a matter of also not only having a feel for people, but having a feel for the culture of how the functions and how you should behave in that context, you know, so that they, they, they see you as a credible source of information. You know, some people don't see it. You know, if you come in and you act in a certain way, they might see it unprofessional, although that's your technique. That's the way to approach and to have to create this environment of, of um, empathy and, and openness and talking about it. In other cultures, it's the opposite effect. If you go with a serious approach and a very, you know, serious persona, you go into a, a culture that's a little bit more loose, a little bit more accept, looking for more of a, uh not not as much tightness and more looseness in, in in the person then you will also not be accepted and and uh to to pick you up back off what you said with the budgets with that i had mentioned before as well it depends on the team obviously because covid destroyed some teams but it also in some depending on the the industry that the sponsors or the owners are in it may have exploded a little bit you know so it depends also which country or which which league you 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 gain you go for they have a budget for for that. And it looks more legit if there is a mental performance coach full-time who is with the team and, and is there to to be as a consultant to the coaches, to the players, to the to the management, to the med medical staff. A lot of times the medical staff provides a lot of that mental coaching as well because they have the ones with experience. They have a lot of, they listen to a lot of things. They, they know how to handle those situations within the, 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 the locker room. You know, there's a lot of nuances and dynamics that when the, there's different when the coaches are in the, in the locker room and the coaches are out of the locker room, you know, the medical staff is always around and they hear and they, 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 they absorb all of it. And they also have certain techniques that they use, I'm sure. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's, um, you know, the being, being around and being able to, to, to contribute because how does it look if, me as an assistant coach or as uh and you know if i tell the conditioning coach what to do or vice versa if the conditioning coach is too involved in the coaching aspect x knows and tells how we're supposed to do things it doesn't look right you know towards the players towards us you know it just doesn't right so the same approach should be also for mental performance coaches you know some I can contribute a little bit. The head coach from his experience can contribute a little bit. And then everybody does a little bit, but there's not one person who does it all or who has that, that his, his, um, 
topic or his circle that he's responsible for and can you know share his experience and his views directly and has some 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 data maybe to back it up you know some examples from the past and those those you know mental performance coaches in, a, in an aspect where they have their own area area of of uh, of expertise is important to have but as i said it is going to depend on you know some 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 professional teams have only two one or sometimes only uh, sometimes two sometimes only one assistant coach on the bench full-time assistant coach there might be two on the bench but only one of them is full-time the other one has other jobs jobs to do you know if we're talking about middle of the pack of germany or france or whatever so there is a budget problem that they don't see the allocation of it that we can also talk about that there's not enough teams allocating enough money to the scouting department they don't have full-time scouts that are just you know scattering the 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 the, the world for for undiscovered talents that should be playing higher there's not the resources and it depends on the club are allocated to certain aspects of the of the of the game and it really depends on the on the gm on the on the ownership if they want to allocate the money and they see fit for that to be done because a lot of the, in europe a lot of the staff is overloaded with the coaching staff is overloaded with video work individual work preparation for scouting for 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 the teams for the for the opponents all all those things you know you're constantly there and then you also have you know family life or whatever to 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 take care of so there is a problem of overload and budget issues that are allocated to one area or the other you know and that's i think in europe that's mostly for the for the mediocre teams for the medium level teams is always going to be an issue all right And it's true that earlier, like to me, a situation in the coaching staffs right now, uh, most of the philosophy, it's like when we're talking as a coach, you're going to be talking like a, mainly as a fixed mindset instead of developing mindset. And in situations, specific situations, like, for example, you know, like we're getting we're getting killed on the boards or we turning the ball over too often. And very often coaches are going to relate to those situations in a fixed mindset instead of having the developing mindset of, okay, uh, let's work together in finding the inner motivation, the intent of doing the work to not do those uh, turnovers or, or to not get kicked, on the, uh, kicked out on the boards. You know what I mean? And if you give back, a, if you give a sense to the players about why they should respect the fundamentals and why they should be able to, um, to, to call the, to, to, to call the, the, the shots, look at the tra trajectory, go with the right timing and with intensity to get the boards, you can eventually gain uh, five or six more defensive rebounds instead of getting like uh, 16 or 17 defensive rebounds taken by the other team. You know what I mean? And, and when you manage to get five or six more defensive rebounds and eventually three or four uh, less turnovers, like I watched games yesterday again, same thing. People are going out of bounds in almost every game. How did you expect that? You know what I mean? Like you tell my son is nine years old and he's been playing a few years, but you tell players of that age, those are the lines that you cannot get out. Otherwise you're out of bounds. And we're talking about the best professional players in the world. And they're going out of bounds very often when they are like in the corner or next to the, to the baseline, you know, uh, to the sideline actually. And, and you're like, those are things that it's easy as a coach. You don't need to say those things, but guess what? The players are not aware. They are aware, but they're not aware. So is it because when they practice, they eventually practice without paying attention about it and they go out of bounds because they make negative step instead of going side step? You know what I mean? Those are things that you can eventually reduce turnovers, get more I can rebounds. give you a quote. What do you say? I can give you a quote on that. And that's that's the that's the end of it because that's, that, that showed me the whole picture and... Um, I was with, in Moscow with Trajan Langdon. I, I think that name is familiar. And he is like, if you're stepping on the line too much, whether it's the three-point line or the out-of-bounds line, you're just not in the gym enough. That's the bottom of the line. That's the bottom. And if you're in a gym and you, you can blindly tell, like you can put me on the spot somewhere in the gym and then I open my eyes, I see the rim, I know if I'm on a line or not. I know if I'm on a out of bounce line or if I'm on a three point line. If you're in the gym and the and, and working on your game enough, you're not gonna step on a line. But is it just about being in the gym, or is it being making sure that when you're there, you're present, and that making sure that when you're there, you're you're making quality work? Because 
professional of that level. I mean, I could eventually tell you that Luca Dancy step on the line. I have to find the video, but I can't find it. What I'm saying, yeah, absolutely, is, presence is, is presence is 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 absolutely like, necessary. That's again the work of mental performance in the way. And I'm not trying to contradict what you're saying. I'm just saying that you know, like the mental performance work is also like helping coaches in the way that you guys are working so hard. And like you said, you know, with the film study, scouting, uh, strength and conditioning, tactical, technical, everything. But in the end, at some point, the players are not here. And they're not here because earlier you were talking about, okay, certain player, you might have to joke around with him or understand when you're going to need to talk to him about this and that. But at some time of the season, it's going to be a certain way. And maybe several months later, it's going to be a different way because, you know, like, Time flies during the season and it's going yeah. to be a mindset. And it's true that uh, it's the beauty of, uh, of, of human spirit. So, I mean, um, I, ju- I just think that there is so much that we that we need to keep developing on those and, and to help players and coaches again. And it's not about telling one truth, but it's really about gaining time, about all the investment that's done by the players and the coaches to help them uh, on that aspect of the game. But yeah, it's, it's, tell me it's, then. It's a, the truth... There's, you know, we always argue because everybody has their own sort of truth based on their experiences from the past and the 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 the, the environment they grew in, grew up in, the people that influenced them, the coaches, and they come in with their own package, and that's the same again in the relationship. You know, you, you, the per, one person has their own truth, you have your truth. You constantly clashing because you have a different perspective on things. He's laughing at her, her, she's laughing at him just because it's a different, completely different mindset. But it, and if you have in the team, you have different truths. It's just a matter of combining, combining parts of the truth, you know, and and finding the parts that intertwine with each other. Not the whole truth doesn't have to match. If it matches, great. But it doesn't. You have at least five different parties agreeing on part of the truth, and that's already the thing that you probably have to go with. And I remember when we met in Paris a few months back. I remember you also saying that in the network, it's not important to know everybody but to know the right people. And I believe that it's the same way when you work as a mental performance coach. I only want to work with people who have similar vision so that we can go towards the same path. And that's uh, very important to be successful. So, Ben, we're supposed to keep it half an hour. I apologize for the delay. I'm really usually... That's my on, fault. <laughs> on, on, uh, I really would love to talk to you for hours again. It's not a problem. And I hope we'll have the opportunity to do it in the future. Uh, so thank you again for all of your time. I really appreciate every uh, insight that you gave, the experience and everything. And I'm sure it's going to be very valuable to, to our listener over the world. So thank you again for everything. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you.